Sounds good. Sweet. So Roger, th thank you so much for agreeing to join us today. Uh, I, Brennan kind of saw your talk and was raving about it. And so we, we invited you and, you know, we're, we're excited to see it. Um, and, uh, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and immediately give you the floor. I'm, I'm excited to see what uh, what you've been working on and learn about graph neural networks. Great. Uh, thanks. Yeah. So like, uh, you know, thanks for the kind introduction. And today I'll be talking about the system Marius GNN, um, which is a system for large scale training of graph neural networks on a single machine. So as I was saying, I like to start out by considering an application that most of us are familiar with, which is getting driving directions using something like Google Maps. So for example, um, as I said, I'm in Utah right now, but maybe I'd want to drive to Boston, um, Northeastern, for example. And so then I'd look at how to get there using Google Maps. And maybe this drive isn't super realistic. The US is quite big. Uh, but either way, you know, most of us have probably used Google Maps before. But how many of us actually know how to decide or how Google decides which route to suggest? So since 2021, Google Maps actually predicts the estimated time of arrival for route options using graph neural networks. And so possibly without even knowing it, many of us have actually used the predictions of a graph neural network before in our daily lives. And it's not just Google Maps, graph neural networks are everywhere. So there is a state-of-the-art ML model over many forms of graph, or many forms of data, which are best represented as graphs. So for example, some of the common applications are ML over chemical and protein structures, social and biological networks, and knowledge graphs. And just like all areas of machine learning these days, real-world graphs are continuing to increase in size. So for example, the largest open graph benchmark data set, a subset of the Microsoft Academic Graph, contains hundreds of millions of nodes and billions of edges. And together with the feature data for each of the nodes in this graph, the storage overhead exceeds 380 gigabytes of data. But some real world graphs can be even much larger. So take, for example, the web hyperlink graph from 2012, which contains multiple terabytes of node representations and edge information. So a number of systems have been developed to help practitioners train GNNs over these large graphs. And two of the most popular these days are DGL and PyTorch Geometric. But the problem with these systems is that we found they can be really expensive for training over large scale graphs. So for example, if we wanna learn embeddings for all the nodes in this hyperlink 2012 graph for the application of detecting duplicates or to aid in web search, for example, we estimate that this would cost $10,000 per epic with DGL. And this expensive training primarily occurs for two reasons. So first, to scale to large graphs, these systems opt for multi-GPU training or multi-machine training with the graph data and the node representations stored in the aggregate memory of this cluster. And this design requires that you utilize and pay for machines which scale together with the graph size. So for example, this Hyperlink 2012 graph with 3.4 terabytes of node and edge information would require at least that much available CPU memory and so if you're using AWS, for example, this would require maybe 10 machines, which each total, in total costing hundreds of dollars per hour. And by itself, that doesn't necessarily lead to expensive training costs, but the issue is that these systems also underutilize their available hardware. So for example, the GPU utilization of DGL on a common large scale GNN benchmark is only about 45%. And this problem is exacerbated as more resources are added to scale to large graphs. So for example, DGL multi-GPU training on the same graph has an average GPU utilization of only about 35%. And so this results in sublinear speedups, longer run times, and ultimately expensive training. So in Mario's GNN, we decide to go for a different approach. And the main idea is to minimize the cost of GNN training by maximizing the resource utilization on a single machine. So in order to do this, Mari's GNN is built around two key ideas. The first is that in order to maximize GPU utilization, we have to focus on making GNN mini batch preparation and processing as efficient as possible on machines with limited resources. And the second key idea is that in order to scale to large graphs, in Mari's GNN, we're gonna take advantage of all the available resources on a single machine, in particular, including the cheap and high capacity disk storage 
rather than paying for sufficient CPU memory to store entire large graphs. But of course, of course, in order to do that, we had to figure out how to actually utilize disk storage during training without bottlenecking the training process or hurting the model accuracy. So by optimizing this resource utilization on a single machine, in Mario Sheenan, we can actually learn vector representations for all the nodes in that hyperlink 2012 graph using just one machine with a V100 GPU and only 61 gigabytes of RAM. This led to a total cost of just $564 per Epic, down about 18X compared to our $10,000 estimate for DJL. And Mars GNN is open source, so if any of you are interested, you can download it and try it out and let us know what you think. So that kind of gives a high-level introduction of the Mars GNN system. And for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to focus on those kind of two key ideas in more detail. First, I'll start with how we optimize mini-batch preparation and processing to maximize GPU utilization. And then I'll move on to the disk-based training for large graphs. So before we get into the GNN mini batch training, I want to highlight kind of the key ideas for this section of the talk. So the first thing is that we're going to see two key challenges for training GNNs. First is a data movement challenge. And the second is that multi-layer GNNs require sampling these multi-hop neighborhoods from the graph for each mini batch. Then I'll highlight that existing sampling methods for constructing these multi-hop neighborhoods perform a lot of redundant work and thus lead to lower GP utilization. And then with that in mind, I'll introduce the techniques in Marius GNN to hide data movement through pipelining and to minimize sampling redundancy in order to maximize GPU utilization. So just a little bit of background on graph neural networks before we get into the details. So concretely, a GNN takes as input a base vector representation for each node I, which we denote by H superscript zero. And these can be node features, or they can be actually learned parameters part of the ML model itself. And then the GNN produces higher level representations for each node I by combining its own representation with the vector representations of all or a sample of its neighbors. So for example, here's a graphical depiction of a GNN. If we want to compute the higher level representation H1 for the node Wisconsin, we can do this by aggregating its own base representation H0 with that of its neighbors, Illinois and Madison in this example graph. And in this case, the aggregation might just be a simple weighted summation of the three vectors. So some common GNNs, which you might've heard of that follow this structure are GraphSage, the Graph Convolution Network and the Graph Attention Network. And then once you have the higher level representations from the GNN model, you can use them for downstream ML tasks. So for example, you could predict the label of a node by running its higher level representation through a softmax layer. Alternatively, you can predict information about edges rather than nodes by combining the higher level representation of both the edges source and destination node. And now that we've sort of covered a little bit of background of GNNs, we can start to see the challenges of GNN training. So the first issue is that for every node, we have to store and access these base representations during training. So you can store that in a sort of table that you call capital H0. And this can quickly become a lot of data. So for example, if you have 1 billion nodes and each one has a feature vector of dimension 100, then you have about 100 billion floats or 400 gigabytes of data to store. And this can easily exceed the capacity of GPU accelerators. And the second challenge, which I'll highlight in much more detail as we continue to go, is that every time we want to compute the GNN output for a specific node, we need to know at least some of its neighbors, which means we need to query the graph for this information repeatedly during training. So given that the storage overhead for those large graphs can exceed GPU memory capacities, the kind of common training process for large GNNs is to use mixed CPU GPU mini batch training. And in this setup, the graph data and the base vector representations are stored in CPU memory, and then mini batches are prepared on the CPU before being sent to the GPU for model computation. So to highlight this process in more detail so that everyone kind of has the same background, the first step is to sample batches of training examples from the graph in CPU memory. And training examples for GNNs can be task dependent, but they're either generally subsets of nodes of the graph or subsets of the edges. 
And then if we're using a GNN, we have to sample the neighbors for all the nodes in our batch so that we have the relevant information to perform the GNN neighborhood aggregation. And only once we've sampled all the neighbors needed for the batch, then we can load the base vector representations for all nodes, which will participate in the GNN computation. And then send that information from the CPU memory to the GPU memory, and then perform the GNN forward and backward pass using some desired task dependent loss. So Roger, I just to be clear, yep. graph is so freaking large that you you have to like store in a linear size way, right? You can't have some sort of table like to look things up. And that's why it's annoying to look up the the neighbors of a node because you can't just like have some data structure where you index by node and then you immediately have all the neighbors because then it would your data, you know, like a hash table or something. Yep work yeah so the the graph the graph like the edges so that the the, the base vector representations you can store kind of in like a lookup table this capital yeah. h zero and then the graph you can store yeah that's kind of um system dependent so we store it as like an edge list um but it's sorted based on some like source node id or destination node id so we can you know practically in constant time look up the neighbors for a node just by knowing yeah. where the offset is okay. so basically like a hash table the the challenge more so is that um, in these really large graphs, some some of these nodes have millions of neighbors. So okay. you cannot actually just use all the neighbors for the GNN computation because even just the neighbors of one node would already exceed the GPU memory capacity. So you have to perform sampling sort of no matter what. Um, so even though you can access where the neighbors are sort of quickly, um, you still have to randomly sample over that set. And we, we'll, we'll see that, you know, sort of this repeated sampling of neighbors of all the nodes can can add up quickly. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, hundred percent. Thanks. Cool. Yep. So um, you know, like we said, once you kind of get everything to the GPU, then you can do the GNN forward and backward pass computation, and then you can update the GNN parameters, which are usually stored on the GPU themselves because they're not that large; they're just like some weight matrices. Um, but the base vector representations themselves may also be learned. So if, if they are, then you may get gradients for them, uh, which you then need to transfer back to the CPU in sort of the final step of the training process. So at this point, at least the data movement challenge should start to become clear. So if you just execute this mixed CPU GPU training, sort of one step sequentially after another, then the GPU is going to be waiting for mini batches to be prepared on the CPU and transferred to and from the GPU. And this is often sort of the key primary reason why existing systems have low GPU utilization. So in Mari's GNN to sort of keep the GPU 100% busy with computation, what we do is utilize a pipeline to overlap mini batch preparation and data movement with the mini batch processing on the GPU. And specifically in order to do this, basically we break every stage in the training process into its own set of workers, which only focus on that task. And then workers read and write their input and output to a set of queues between each stage in the training process. So this allows each stage to run in parallel. And it also allows you to assign more workers to the slower stages in order to maximize the pipeline performance. And while pipelining can actually improve performance quite a bit, um, for GNN training, it's actually not sufficient uh, in itself. And this, the reason is that the second key problem here with GNN mini batch training is that this neighborhood sampling step can be generally considerably slower than all other steps because of the fact that these multi-layer GNNs require sampling these multi-hop neighborhoods from the graph. And those multi-hop neighborhoods grow exponentially in size with respect to the number of GNN layers. So for example, we found that neighborhood sampling on the CPU in PyTorch Geometric is about seven times slower than the model computation on the GPU. And with such a discrepancy in runtime, even if you have many sampling workers running in parallel for every compute worker, it's still gonna be difficult to saturate the GPU, especially if you're on a machine with limited CPU resources to parallelize the sampling. So I just wanna like kind of work through an example to highlight this sampling challenge. So let's say that we're using a two layer GNN and we start with these blue nodes A and B um, as part of our batch. So by using a two-layer GNN, we know that we want to compute H2 for each of these nodes. And in order to do so, we need their H1 representations and an H1 representation of a sample of their neighbors. 
So for example, let's assume that we're going to sample two incoming neighbors per node at maximum. So we might sample nodes C and D as incoming neighbors of node A, and node A is the only incoming neighbor of node B. But you still can't actually compute H2 for either node because we don't know any of the first layer representations H1. So once again, you need to sample one of neighbors for these four nodes from the graph. For example, we might sample neighbors as so. And only once you've completed sampling this two-hop neighborhood can you actually access the base representations H0 for all the necessary nodes to compute the desired GNN output. So just to go back to the previous question, the reason you have to kind of do this sampling repeatedly is that, for one, your mini batches can often be randomized. So maybe one time you'll have nodes A and B, another time you'll have nodes A and C, et cetera. So you get different nodes. And then also, as I was saying, to sort of help cap the size of this computation graph, usually you sample a maximum number of nodes per neighbors per node. Um, and that sort of maximum neighbors per node introduces a random sampling process, um, which means that you sort of have to do this repeatedly. And yeah, so this, this is sort of, as we've been alluding to, this is one of the key challenges for GPU, uh, mixed CPU, GPU, mini batch GNN training. Um, because every time you're preparing these mini batches, you need to sort of sample k hop neighborhood from the graph. And this these k hop neighborhoods can grow in size very quickly. And as I've sort of said as well, constructing these multi hop neighborhoods is actually not cheap because doing so is basically a bunch of random lookups to the edges in the graph, as well as adding all of this information to this sort of sampling data structure. So the problem that makes this even worse in existing systems is that they perform a lot of redundant single hop sampling to construct these multi-hop neighborhoods. So in our example, we were traversing this two layer GNN and we started by sampling the one hop neighbors for nodes A and B. But then again, we sampled the one hop neighbors for nodes A and B in the second step, even though we had already done that sampling before in the first step. And so this is common practice in existing systems like DGL, where they sample neighbors for all unique nodes at every frontier in the sampling process. So that led us to sort of a key idea in Marius GNN, which is to minimize single hop sampling redundancy while constructing these multi-hop neighborhoods by caching and reusing previous samples in each mini batch. And in order to do this, we needed some way to track which nodes needed sampling at each step. And we wanted an efficient way to sort of construct, store, and process these multi-hop neighborhoods. So to that end, in Marius Shen, we introduced this delta encoding of neighborhood samples data structure, or DENSE for short, which tracks these multi-hop neighborhoods using incremental deltas between each successive sampling hop. And together with some parallel algorithms for constructing DENSE on the CPU and using DENSE on the GPU, this led us to about 14 times faster sampling and eight times faster computation compared to DGL and PyTorch geometric. So back to our running example, Let's assume that we've already sampled the neighbors for the target nodes A and B. And then at this point, the dense data structure contains the information as shown on the right. So we have a node IDs array that contains the target nodes A and B, which we've defined to be delta two in this case, with the two coming from the fact that we're using a two layer GNN. And then the neighbors array stores their sampled one hop neighbors with this neighbor offsets array tracking which neighbor belongs to which node ID. And then at this point, Instead of sampling single hop neighbors for all four nodes, uh, C, D, A, and B, to complete the two hop neighborhood, in Marius Shunen, what we do is we minimize redundant sampling by first identifying nodes which don't yet have any neighbors. So these nodes are easy to identify using dense because they're exactly the nodes that are in the neighbors array that are not in the node IDs array. So for example, it's easy to see in this case that it's, neighbor, it's the nodes C and D. And then we define those nodes to be the delta increment that should be added to dense, delta one in this case. And then we sample one hop neighbors for those nodes. And this actually completes the sampling required for the two layer GNN because the neighbors for nodes A and B in the first GNN layer can be simply copied from the previous sampled edges. And this can complete the GNN computation graph. And notice that this sort of copying can be done without actually any modifications to the dense data structure. And then just for completeness, this final delta, delta zero, which contains node E in this example, is only needed as input to the first GNN layer, but doesn't actually require any neighbors for the computation. 
So that's kind of a high level overview of dense. And there's a lot of implementation details that are in the paper or in the code itself. But the main things other to highlight is that um, dense is sort of amenable to optimize kernels for GPU computation. And we have some algorithms, parallel algorithms for constructing dense on the CPU for high performance. And interestingly, we compared dense to some sort of specialized optimized kernels developed in Nextdoor uh, for sampling on the GPU. And we found that the sample reuse in dense actually allows us to scale better with respect to the number of GNN layers and ultimately actually outperform some optimized sampling implementations for three and four layer GNNs. So yeah, just to summarize again, this part of the talk, in Mars GNN, we were able to sort of reduce the multi-op sampling time and computation time for GNN mini batch preparation and processing by developing this dense data structure and together with pipelining all the stages in this mini batch training process, this allowed Marius GNN to sort of maximize GPU utilization and therefore quickly train GNNs on machines with limited resources. So that kind of completes the first part of the talk. And then we'll shift gears a little bit now and focus on the second key idea in Marius GNN, which is to scale training to large graphs by using cheap disk storage. So just for the, as for the previous section, uh, let's highlight the key ideas before we get started. So in this section, the, the main challenge for disk-based training is going to be to simultaneously achieve high throughput and high model accuracy. And specifically, the problem is that these goals are actually in conflict with each other because fast training generally requires sequential access to data on disk, but high accuracy training we'll see is going to require random access to data on disk. And then after sort of going through these challenges, uh, we'll end this section with some discussion on some flexible disk-based policies that we use in Marius GNN to allow us to sort of try and achieve both of these goals simultaneously. So before getting into the details, let's just remind ourselves why we're interested in this disk-based training in the first place. So we just talked a lot about this mixed CPU GPU mini batch training. And while that's great for graphs which fit in CPU memory, we also know that there are even larger graphs that can exceed the memory capacity of a single machine. So for example, the Hyperlink 2012 graph from the very beginning, which had about 3.4 terabytes of storage. And as mentioned in the intro, basically there's two scenarios to handle this. So existing systems opt for either a larger machine or multiple machines, which together have enough CPU memory to store the graph. And then they run some sort of distributed training process. But we also saw that paying for these machines for graph storage can be expensive, especially if some of their resources are underutilized. So the second kind of approach, which we take in Marius GNN, is to store the graph data on disk. And this sort of continues our theme of minimizing cost by optimizing the use of all available resources on a single machine. So Disk-based training, you might think that it's as simple as just sort of moving the graph and the base vector representations from CPU memory to disk, and then sort of extending the pipeline that we described in the first part of the talk to load batches from disk to CPU memory and then move them to GPU memory, et cetera. But unfortunately, disk-based training is not really actually that simple because this training process would require randomly sampling training examples, their multi-hop neighborhoods, and their base vector representations from disk which is sort of a block storage medium. And this is prohibitively expensive given those hardware properties. So instead we need to ensure that the access pattern to the data on disk consists of larger sequential reads and writes so that we can get high performance. And in order to do this, the high level idea is that we are gonna store the graph and the base vector representations on disk, but we're gonna randomly partition them into sequential subsets. And then according to the, we're gonna randomly partition the node uh, representations into sequential subsets. And then according to those node partitions, we can also group the graph edges into sequential edge buckets. And once you have this data layout on disk, then you can load subsets of the graph periodically into CPU memory by sequentially reading node partitions and their corresponding edge buckets. Then once you have some sort of subgraph in memory, then you can run mixed CPU GPU training as we discussed in the first part of the talk on that induced in-memory subgraph. 
And then in this setup, then you can do sort of random sampling of training examples and their multi-hop neighborhoods from the, in the subgraph in memory um, to do mixed CPU, GPU, mini batch training. So just as for dense, we'll have sort of walk through a running example. Um, so let's assume that we have this sort of following graph on disk. And let's say we want to iterate over the graph edges so that we can train a GNN for some edge prediction task. So the first step, as we described, is to partition the graph. So in this case, we might split the, um, the graph into three partitions as shown, A, B, and C. And then we can load, let's say, two partitions into CPU memory. Maybe we start with partitions A and B in this case, and we can also load their edges into memory as well. Then once we have this subgraph in memory, we can use its edges as training examples to create mini batches and start training the GNN model. And once we exhaust the training examples for this in-memory subgraph, we can write out partition B to disk, load in a new partition, partition C in this case, and then create a new in-memory subgraph and continue training on all the new edges that we haven't seen yet. And finally, we can swap A out for B to bring the last two edges from the graph into memory. And this actually then completes sort of one epic of disk-based training because we've iterated over all the edges in the graph. And there's sort of a key piece of the puzzle here, which is not obvious in this slide because we only have three partitions, but you actually need to have a sort of some partition replacement policy, which decides which partition to swap in and out at each step. And basically the idea for that policy is that it should minimize the total number of partition swaps, which will therefore also minimize the total number of disk IOs. And it turns out that a greedy policy, which basically brings into memory the partition which is going to allow for processing the most new training examples that you haven't yet seen is actually sufficient to minimize swaps and therefore IO and therefore runtime. The problem, however, is that this setup of moving these partitions between disk and CPU memory leads to these low accuracy models. So for example, with that greedy partition replacement policy that I just mentioned, you get the results in the right column of this table. So on two data sets and GNN models, the disk-based training results in significantly lower model quality than if you were to train with the full graph in memory. And the reason for this drop in accuracy is that this disk-based setup, while it's beneficial for high throughput, uh, using only the in-memory subgraph at each step to generate the training examples in their multi-hop neighborhoods biases the training to that subset of the graph. So for example, let's turn, turn, return to our running example and focus on the training examples in the last step. If you look at all the edges that are assigned to create mini batches during that in-memory subgraph, you can see that they all contain the same node. And of course, this is a bit of a contrived example on a small graph, but this problem actually holds more generally. So it's always the case that the entire set of examples used for training for a given in-memory subgraph is always gonna be correlated in other words, they're all going to contain nodes from a very small subset of the graph. So this gives you a lack of randomness in the order that you're processing edges each epoch while training the GNN model. And this, this is basically equivalent to, you can think of for image classification, first iterating over all images of cats and then all images of dogs, et cetera, instead of just shuffling all the images together. So this should sort of... Uh, hopefully give us now a sense of the main challenge of disk-based training. Basically, the idea is that we want to develop these policies for using disk that allow for fast training, but they also yield models with accuracy similar to what we would have achieved if we had the whole graph in CPU memory. And basically, the real challenge is that these goals are at odds with each other, because for fast training, we know that we need to access disk sequentially, but for high accuracy training, we need to mimic learning with the full graph in memory, where we're able to sample mini batches in their multi-hop neighborhoods randomly from the full graph instead of only randomly from a subgraph. So in Mari's GNN, our focus was on trying to develop a disk-based policy which had enough flexibility so that we could try to achieve both of these goals. And to do this, we developed a new policy for disk-based training, which utilized two levels of partitioning. And we also focused on increasing the randomness in the order training examples are processed one way to do that is by shuffling which in-memory subgraph processes each example. And with these two new techniques, we were able to reduce the gap of model quality with disk-based training and that of training with the full graph in memory 
by up to 80% for some cases. So looking at this new policy in just a little bit more detail, um, one example policy that uses two-level partitioning, we refer to as the correlation minimizing edge traversal, or Comet for short. And sort of the first high-level idea behind Comet is to increase flexibility by introducing this extra layer of abstraction, the second level of partitioning. So in this case, disk-based training setup consists of physical partitions stored sequentially on disk, as we had before. But now we also introduce these logical partitions. So every epoch, we randomly group the physical partitions on disk into logical partitions. And you can do this without any data movement. You only need to maintain a cheap in-memory partition mapping. And then we move data between disk and CPU memory using these logical partitions according to that greedy policy before, from before, which minimizes I.O. So adding this extra layer of abstraction allows you to independently tune the size of the physical partitions on disk and the amount of data that you swap each step with the logical partitions. And in a few slides, I'll sort of highlight how this flexibility is sort of useful to simultaneously minimize runtime, but also achieve high accuracy. And the second key idea behind these more flexible policies like Comet is very natural. And it's that instead of processing examples immediately, the first time they're brought into CPU memory, you can actually improve randomness by assigning each edge for mini batch training to a random in-memory subgraph chosen from all the possible subgraphs which contain that edge. So for example, the edge between nodes four and six doesn't have to be used for training right away in the first step, but it can instead be processed later in the last step when it reappears in memory again, and this will help increase randomness in the order that you're processing training examples. So just as for dense, this is sort of a very high level overview, and there's a lot of details that, are, that have been skipped. So the main, the main detail that's been skipped here is this, um, is how to actually decide how to best use the two-level flexibility of Comet. So for example, how to set the number of physical partitions and the number of logical partitions. In our paper, we have sort of an analysis of how each of these quantities affects training time and model accuracy. We provide automated rules to maximize performance based on that. And the high-level idea is that to maximize mini-batch mini -batch randomness, you want a lot of small physical partitions because the, the nodes in the same partition, partition are fixed and biased together for the whole training process. But at the same time, you also want a few large logical partitions in order to increase the turnover rate of the graph data between each in-memory subgraph. And given this sort of setup of lots of small physical partitions and the few large logical partitions, to, to achieve high accuracy, the question is, can you also achieve high throughput with that setup? And the answer is yes, as long as you don't allow the physical partitions to become so small that reading them from disk becomes sort of a random read instead of a sequential read. And so we've kind of highlighted this comment policy in detail in this talk, which is meant for iterating over graph edges, but Marius Gian also contains two level disk based policies for iterating over graph nodes for node classification tasks, et cetera. So if we return to those same experiments as before, but now using Comet, we can see that across the two data sets and models, the flexibility of Comet allows you to have the sort of same simultaneously fast training, but higher model quality compared to the original disk-based policy. So for some models like GraphSage on this Freebase 15K237 data set, Comet allows you to reduce the gap to training with the full graph in memory by up to 80%. And at the same time, however, achieving matching model quality um, does remain a challenge, especially for some models and data sets. So the key thing here is to remember that in addition to generating mini batches for each in-memory subgraph, uh, we also need to sample the GNN neighborhoods for every node in the mini batch from that data in memory. And our policies like Comet, for example, address biases with the former, with, with, the, with the training examples themselves that are used to create the mini batches. Uh, but we also have to improve the neighborhood sampling piece, uh, the biases with respect to that, in order to sort of close this final bit of accuracy gap. So we're working on that, and yeah, stay tuned for that. So that kind of concludes the technical content for this talk. And we'll just spend a few minutes um, 
with the, at the remainder of this talk, just to look at how everything we come together, uh, how everything we've discussed comes together for some experiments. And then that should leave us about 20 minutes to just have an open discussion and, and talk about any questions. So uh, in the paper, we compared end-to-end -end training in Mars GNN directly with DGL and PyTorch Geometric. And we evaluated all systems for both the node classification and link prediction tasks using the largest graphs that we had available to us. So the common, the common benchmark graphs range in size from 86 to 122 million nodes and have 338 million to 1.6 billion edges. And we used common graph stage and GAT GNN models, possibly coupled with the dismal score function for link prediction where necessary. So for the hardware setup, we use the AWS P3 GPU instances, which have V100 GPUs. And for baseline systems, since they require the graph data to be stored in CPU memory, we chose the smallest machine, which had enough CPU memory for mixed CPU GPU mini batch training. And we allowed these baseline systems to use multiple GPUs if applicable, but we always trained Marius GNN with a single GPU. And finally, for Marius GNN disk space training, we always used the smallest P3 2X large machine, which doesn't have enough CPU memory to store any of the graphs in the experiments. So looking first just at uh, comparison on the node classification learning task, what we report here is the, the runtime, the accuracy, and the cost of training on two large scale data sets. And for Marius GNN, we report two configurations, one with the full graph and CPU memory on the same large machine as those used by DGL and PyTorch Geometric, and one that utilizes the smaller AWS P3 2X large machine and stores the graph data on disk. So we can see that Mars GNN with a full graph of memory reaches the same level of accuracy, about three to four times faster than the fastest baseline. DGL in this case, even though it's only using one GPU and DGL is using four GPUs. But Mars GNN can also train these uh, GNNs over these graphs using disk-based training on that smaller machine. And even with disk-based training, Mars GNN reaches the same level of accuracy, about three to eight times faster than DGL. And so the key benefit of this disk-based training is that Marius GNN is not restricted to use those expensive machines with lots of CPU memory, um, but we can instead use cheaper machines. And this leads to about 16 to 64 X cheaper training compared to the baseline systems. Although Marius GNN with the full graph in memory is also a bit cheaper than the, the baselines because of the reduced runtime. And similar results are true on the link prediction task. So for mixed CPU, GPU training with the full graph and CPU memory for all systems, Marius GNN reaches the sort of same model quality to six to seven times faster uh, than the fastest baseline. And again, disk-based training support allows Marius GNN to reach the similar model quality using a smaller machine while still training faster than baseline systems. And in this case, that leads to between 13 and 18 X cheaper training for large scaling prediction. So in summary, Mars GNN is a system for pipeline mini batch training of GNNs on a single machine using the entire memory hierarchy. And while building Mars GNN, we focused on two main challenges. First, as we discussed in the first part of the talk, we focused on optimizing mini batch preparation and processing for multi-layer GNNs, which led us to minimize redundant sampling using the dense data structure. And together with our pipelining, this allowed us to maximize GPU utilization on a single machine. And then second, we studied how to train GNNs with graph data stored on disk and realized the importance of sequential access for minimizing disk IO and high throughput, but also the importance of maximizing randomness in order to achieve high accuracy. And this led us to the comet policy for disk space training, as well as a few others discussed in the paper, and allowed us to significantly improve the quality of disk based models. And so kind of the key idea with the whole Marius line of work is that we focus on maximizing the use of available resources before getting more resources for the problem. Yeah, and with that, I'd be happy to take any questions and discuss, yeah, so thanks. Roger, that was awesome, thank you so much. Um, maybe I'll kick us off with, with a, a rather obvious question and then people can come in with more sophisticated ones. Sure. Uh, 
if you had to come up with like the most pathological possible graph, you know, from Marius GNN, what, what would it look like? Like what, what would be the worst uh, um, problem to try to solve with Marius GNN? Yeah, that's a great question, actually. So one thing that's quite, that's quite a challenge with uh, the Marius GNR architecture is when a, a node has only very few neighbors. So th this is a kind of common problem. But you could think of like it's like sort of a long tail distribution. It's it's you know exists when you have images or text as well. But it's also a challenge in Marius GNN, and the reason it's it's a challenge is is that when we do this sort of like subgraph in memory, you know you may not get that one neighbor or the two neighbors. They may still be on disk, and in which case you have no neighbors available for a node in memory, and then you sort of, you know, what do you, what do you do at that point? You you just train your GNN, but you don't actually get any neighbors for that node. So that's sort of a that's sort of a, a big challenge for the for the Marius GNN architecture is these sort of long tailed skewed graphs, particularly the the small the nodes which have a small number of neighbors, the ones which have a lot of neighbors that that's sort of you know you get a good sample of the, their neighborhoods anyway, but yeah, so that's that's a big challenge and sort of the neighborhood sampling piece of the disk based training is something we're sort of actively working on. Yep. Uh, Brandon, you have a question as well, or? Actually, I have two. Okay. Um, so first question is, uh, you, you brought up a couple of points about sequential reading from disk. Yep. Did you ever experiment or play around with SSDs and have um, that as part of the mix as well? Yeah. So these actually are using, like, we've done some experiments with SSDs. Um, but it's still we still find that the random access if you don't have like a fully like ram to do the multi-hop neighborhood sampling then you're like really bottleneck because the multi-hop same neighborhood sampling is really this very heavy random access process uh random access you know set of code where you basically you have a bunch of random nodes for each of those random nodes you have to go read a bunch of random neighbors from the graph edge edges and then you have to go randomly access their base vector representations so it's a very heavy sort of like fine grained random access. Um, that being said, you know, as SSDs get, get, get better. And as we have these sort of like intermediate between RAM and SSD, you know, pieces of memory, like, a, uh, you know, like non-volatile memory, things like that. Um, then you may have, yeah, different trade-offs where you can sort of do more random access to sort of quote unquote disc, um, which we, we currently don't do, but yeah, that's a great question as well. Basically what you want to be able to do is like have random access to as much graph as you can. That's sort of the more, the more of the graph that you have random access to the better accuracy you'll get. So whether that's like, you know, um, it, it all depends on like how much you care about sort of like small accuracy differences for your application how much you're willing to spend on different types of memory, et cetera, right? Um, so it's it's kind of a trade-off that maybe we leave up to the practitioner, to the, to the person running the applications. Because Mario so GNN can also just run on like a big machine with a big CPU memory as well, right? Um, yeah. That kind of uh, is a nice segue into the second question I've got. And that's, it seems like if you're, 64x cheaper. Uh, to, I think that's the best statistic yep. I, I saw in the presentation. That that actually enables new graph neural net architectures mm -hmm. that are deeper and potentially mm -hmm. more expensive. Yep. And so you might actually not have that accuracy issue if point, you yeah. add another layer. Is that something you can speak to at all? Yeah, that's a great point, and especially to like the dense the dense data structure allows us to scale with respect to the number of GP, uh, the number of GNN layers much better than sort of existing implementations. So for example, we can sample, you know, five or six layer multi-hop neighborhood to be used for a five or six layer GNN in the same time that maybe existing systems can sample a three hop neighborhood. Um, but that, that gets you into the question of, uh, which is sort of an ongoing, has been a lot of ongoing work, which is is it actually easy and and do deeper GNNs have help in terms of accuracy? And so like early on in the development of GNNs, uh, 
the answer was not so clear in the same way that it is for maybe images or, or text. And the reason for that is that as you sort of have deeper GNNs, you sort of have much larger neighborhoods and you get into this like over smoothing problem is the, uh, is the, is the term in the literature. But I think that as we continue to sort of work on GNNs, we're going to, we're going to sort of be able to overcome that issue and deeper GNNs will help, especially as you have, you know, complicated, large graphs. Um, you know, I can easily envision five, six, 10 layers being helpful. Um, so that's, that's something very interesting to explore, but we, we have not really done that ourselves. Um, so most of the benchmarking we did is sort of on these sort of common, common graphs with common GNNs and then by common GNN, most of the time you're focusing on like a three layer graph stage. Um, but yeah, scaling with respect to layers in terms of accuracy would be, would be interesting to look at. Yep. Hey, I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Um, also just hearing a three layer network sounds very deep. It does sound I, very funny. Yeah. It's a huge, um, single machine. Um, yep. any, any, are you, are you going to, I guess the research and the novel contribution is like really utilizing that single machine really well. Mm -hmm. Would there be any directions towards multi-machine? Yep. So I am working on a, um, we're working on some distributed versions because single machine, I, I say we, we advocate for like, you know, fully utilizing your resources before scaling out to more resources, but we don't advocate for not scaling out at all. Right. So for example, like, the hyperlink 2012 graph, once you get to sort of like full GPU utilization, that's great. But on a single machine, you still have to iterate over 128 billion edges, for example, per epic. And that's just a lot of training examples. So fundamentally, if you want to bring the, the runtime down, you have to, once you get 100% GPU utilization, then you have to sort of scale out. So we are sort of, yeah, actively working on some, yeah, distributed versions, I guess, of Marius GNN, you, could, you can call it. Cool, thanks. Yep. Wes works at AWS and is actively contemplating getting a bonus by making a Marius GNN product for AWS right now. That is the context of that question. I see. I'm doxing Wes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's there's been a lot of GNN work at uh at AWS with like I mean that's where DJL right comes from and uh, they they have a new system I think as well. Yeah, um, I'm just teasing. Um, there's also kind of, you didn't mention this, but there's like sort of an interesting like tech equity aspect to work like this, right? I mean, you're, the big thing people complain about in academic machine learning is that mm. only the wealthy labs get to make any meaningful right. 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 So th there is an interesting aspect to kind of philosophically making it so that um, uh, kind of top tier tools are accessible to labs that don't have... Yeah. Yeah, the, the most advanced clusters. Yeah, that's kind of one thing like Jason and I, kind of the the two people I've been primarily working on, Marius, the Marius project, we we both came from like physics undergrad. So we had, we worked in these like physics labs and that we still sort of have a little bit of that like motivation in the, in the back of our minds, which is to try to make these models, like high accuracy models, sort of uh, easily accessible to you know, sort of domain scientists, right? Not even computer scientists, but people, um, you know, in in paleobiology and physics and in medicine, all these things, right? Um, so for those people, you want to build a system that's sort of like easy to download, easy to run. I mean, that's one thing that's nice about the single machine as well is that it's usually an easier deployment than sort of a distributed setup. Um, and yeah, hopefully one day, maybe some people will run some cool applications. Uh, with Marius or Marius Jean. Roger, what are you working on next? Um, I was working on some data pruning uh, recently. So I kind of work like at a very high level, I work on sort of like resource efficient training. Um, so resource efficient training can be systems um, side of it, but you can also have like al algorithmic side, like model compression, um, data pruning, things like that. So I was working on some data pruning things, uh, which was getting me a little bit into the LLM world. Um, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to 
keep going in that direction or not. It's very, very hot, but also very crowded right now. Right. Um, and then I also have kind of, you know, continuing to work on Marius Gina and Marius making them more uh, usable. Like the system is, you know, just, just making docs, et cetera, GitHub, all those things, and then the distributed version as well. Um, so yeah, I like to work on making training or inference just more efficient generally. That's kind of the, the main driver of my research, I guess. If, if you want inspiration for a direction, one place we could really use this type of like very resource constrained optimized thinking mm -hmm. is in SMT solving. Um, there's okay. big competitions every year in SMT solving. Yep. And uh, you see some pretty wacky creative ideas, but there's also yeah. a name for this is like Frankfurt's effect or something from economics, but people will start to optimize for the competition criteria and then mm -hmm. come up with counter examples where their, their ideas totally fall apart. And there was a very funny winner a few years ago in one of these competitions that was simply a neural network that would decide which one of the tools from the prior year's competition to use on, Interesting. A, <laughs> on a given SMT problem. Um, but SMT is really wacky and counterintuitive, and there might be some interesting work to be done there with uh, um, yeah, more efficient uh, procedures. Yeah, I like these problems which have like... Um you know, like a, a systems and an algorithmic side to it. Right. And so like, it's not, it's not so cut and dry. Like maybe you want to like improve something on the system side, but then that, that affects the model. Right. And like, kind of like how we had here, or like you want to change the model or the algorithm. And then does that allow you to sort of like do something cool on the system side? Right. Um, so yeah, also there's something very interesting about systems problems where you're dealing with a data structure where your optimization is not for like the theoretical uniform distribution of that data structure, but rather for the existing distribution in problems that human beings care about. Yep. And yep. SMT is an example of that, but I'm sure graphs are too. Like mm -hmm. that like if you, not that there exists a uniform distribution of graphs, but if you were to come up with one, it would not align with the distribution of graphs that people study. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. There's like all this work on like power law graphs, right? I mean, there's like entire papers that are just focused on that specific type of graph that just happens to be what we all see in, in real life, right? Yeah, um, totally. Check the chat here. Brennan was just saying he and I are on the same yeah. page. That, yeah, got gotcha. you. Cool. Well, we have a small crowd, so if there's no more questions, we can call it a wrap. I, I don't know. Does anybody else have any, any burning uh, queries that we want to shoot off? I, I actually do. Um, what is your favorite part of Park City so far? Uh, so, I mean, I'm really into biking. So um, I like, I don't know, I like in the summer, I really like biking, mountain biking, road biking. Um, so, I mean, it's just generally, you know, you climb from Park City up the mountain a little bit and then you descend. Um, the descent is really fun. Um, yeah. It's not, not my first time here, but yeah, it's it's my first, like, I've been here for a month now this summer. So it's my first, like, extended block kind of um, in the summer, which has been nice, but going to head back to Madison next week, I think. Yeah. What about you guys? You guys are also familiar with Park City as well, then, I guess. Um. So as a local, we don't usually go to Park City very often because okay. it's more of a touristy place. Um, all of my favorite like Alta and resorts. Snowbird and all those places are also like super touristy, right? Uh, so, yeah. Much, much less touristy. Deer Valley and Park City are definitely the touristy ones. Okay. Okay. Um, Interesting. And then like Alta and Brighton were kind of the, the resorts I went to when I lived there. Um I think, you know, Utah's just a fantastic place. So I hope you yep. enjoy. Yeah. Yeah, it's very different than in Wisconsin. <laughs> not, not that Wisconsin is bad, but it's just, yeah. I mean, it was, the Madison is nice too because it has like, it's on, it's like on this isthmus, right, with, with two lakes. So it can be nice in the summer as well. Um, but you just there's just mountains out here, you know, which they just, just aren't in the Midwest. And, yeah. you know. If you like the mountains you know you can't you can't really compete <laughs> but, i miss my mountains too so yeah. i'm glad that you enjoy them <laughs> yeah yeah they're, they're nice for sure
guess I guess I'll probably even go biking after this as well. Um, that sounds good, Roger. I'll I'll shoot you an email. Maybe we can grab lunch tomorrow. Yeah, it sounds good. Yeah, let's 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 meet up. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. Great. Cool. That's, well, thank that's, you. that's a coincidence that we're both here, but yeah, yeah, very funny. Um, this is a ton of fun. Really good talk, and and I hope uh, I more people enjoy it after the fact. I put it online. Uh, Roger, if people have questions and they want to email you, I assume they can just email this email. Yeah, me. for sure. Just email me. And uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Happy to to chat with you guys and enjoyed it. And you know, happy to stay in touch as well, especially yeah. if you guys are uh, getting interested in GNNs, etc. Um, yeah. Or or if more people go to Park City, it's gonna be the Park City Computation Club soon. For sure, for sure. We can all, we can we can have Park City meetups or whatever. Yeah, sick. Fantastic. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much, Roger. Talk yeah, to you later. Thanks, guys. All right. Bye.